Okay, welcome to our Africana Studies Student Symposium 2020. We're doing this a little differently because of the circumstances, which is also fun. Um, so we are going to start off um, by hearing from Egypt Bird, who is going to talk about African American representation in media and effects of colorism. And Egypt is a senior about to graduate in communications and is also has also been the Africana Studies student assistant for the past two years and has been very much involved in the program. So it's really great that she can present to us today. After Egypt, I will then talk about how we're going to go about the rest of the program. Um, Cameron Abila is not with us, but sent a recorded presentation and then we will, um, so I'll explain that, we'll go from there. Um, but I just want to, uh, before we turn the time over to Egypt, to say we're really excited to hear about what students are doing um, in this uh, program here at BYU. And uh, we're, it's just really fun to see uh, what students are doing in classes, in study abroad programs, and all the great work. And it's a good way for us to learn from each other. So I will now turn the time over to Egypt. Okay. Thank you. I'm so excited. I'm just going to get right into it. So I want you to picture a chocolate commercial. I think we've all seen one, but just picture the rich milk chocolate drizzling from a whisk of a master chef's hand, the perfectly colored puffs of cocoa somehow highlighting the beauty of the brown color. Until recently, that was some of the only positive representation African Americans had of themselves in broadcast television and commercials. Now you might be thinking, well, that's a little ridiculous, kind of dramatic, and you might be right. But the reality is that African Americans are some of the most under and misrepresented people in broadcast television and commercials. Now, this mistreatment goes even beyond the TV screen. When my mom was in college, she had a drama professor that would use a phrase to justify why he would only cast light-skinned members as the lead roles. It went a little something like this. If you're light, you're all right. If you're brown, stick around. But if you're black, get back. Now, I didn't really understand what this phrase meant when I was growing up, but as I grew older and I began studying communications, came to BYU, I began studying African American communities and the way that American culture socialized them to think about African American, African Americans in general. And then it dawned on me, this phrase was lifting up light skinned individuals and demeaning those with dark skin in the African American community. This is known as colorism. Now I'm going to talk a lot about colorism, but my main point is that the negative stigmas that we as Americans have surrounding racial representation in the media stem from three things, colorism, palatability, and normalization. When these three concepts, when we understand these three concepts and how they work in society, we are able to understand the way that the media uses them to influence us. My goal today is to help you understand why representation and colorism matter and to explain the significance of how these two concepts affect the way we view media. Now, in order to have a good conversation about palatability and normalization, we have to understand what colorism is and where it came from. So let me explain. Colorism stems from prejudice and discrimination based on skin color. In formal terms put by Margaret Hunter, a form of colorism is a form of discrimination based on skin tone that routinely privileges light-skinned people of color and penalizes dark-skinned people of color. Now colorism happens in all minority communities, but today I'm going to focus on colorism in the African American community. Skin color is so important in our society, regardless of what we might tell ourselves. But I can think of every summer since middle school where I would get together with my friends and somehow the conversation would always turn to tan lines. They would talk about their sandal tan lines. They would talk about their bracelet tan lines. And don't even get me started about their farmer's tan lines. 
But that, those conversations were nothing compared to when I walked into a drugstore here at, in Provo, Utah, my first semester of college. I remember going to the makeup section and only seeing foundation with titles like sand or natural. I began thinking, well, what happens to sand when it gets wet? It's not that color. And their natural is definitely not my natural. Now, unlike the lack of colors in the scales and Walgreens in the makeup aisle, there are so many different shades, if you will, of African Americans, but there's no unified scale that we have to identify the different skin colors. But unfortunately, in the early 1900s, the government created something called the brown paper bag test. Now it's pretty self-explanatory, but what it is, is that those with who were lighter, not the same color, but lighter than a brown paper bag, were considered light. Or as mentioned earlier, I. So but even before the brown paper bag test, uh, colorism dates back to slavery. This is when slave masters would put those with lighter skin in working positions such as taking care of the kids or in the kitchen. Now this division between the house slaves and the field slaves brought about a standard of beauty and acceptance that was enforced then and is still in effect in society today. This double standard is what I refer to as palatability. We just learned that colorism lifts up those with light skin and holds back those with dark skin. But put into practice in society, this looks like favoritism. African Americans with dramatically lighter skin have a social advantage over those with darker skin because they are perceived more proximate to whiteness subconsciously in many minds. We know again from Margaret Hunter, her research in 2013 states that whites report feeling more comfortable with lighter skinned African Americans. One of my favorite celebrity examples of this is Trevor Noah. He's a funny guy. And if you've seen any of his sketches, you know that he likes to joke about politically touchy topics. Now, during one of his shows that I was watching, he did a segment on the oh so controversial N word. I began observing his statement or his his sketch and I didn't count how many times he used the n-word but I did look at how he used the n-word. It made me think well what if other comics such as Dave Chappelle or Kevin Hart had used similar humor it probably would have come off as harsh or brash. The reality is that Kevin or that um, Trevor Noah used humor combined with his mixed uh, African and white heritage that created an ease among those who were watching it. Why is this the case? Well, it all comes back to palatability and what we're taught to accept through the media. Scholars have found that African Americans whose skin is lighter and whiter are more favored, allowing them to progress higher on the ladder of success than those who have darker pigmentation. The negative effects of colorism go even beyond television and into the household, a setting that is very highly portrayed in commercials and broadcast television shows. According to Keith and Herring, those with very light skin, if we remember back to the brown paper bag, so very light skin, have a 50% greater familial income than those with very dark skin. In another study, similar results were found that said that African Americans with darker skin are 11 times more likely to be discriminated against than those with light skin. They also noted that Caucasians reported to feel at ease among those with less pigmentation in their skin. Or in other words, African Americans whose skin is proximate to whiteness are more accepted. With only the most acceptable people chosen, television shows and commercials are broadcast to millions around the United States, but specifically to the biggest visual learners all over the world, children and young teens. Now, since many people in America have become homeschool parents overnight, children are spending more and more time at home and exposed to media. And just because sports were canceled doesn't mean that regular broadcast television shows are. 
Children are literally sponges when it comes to viewing TV. In fact, young kids are more likely to internalize inaccurate representations of minorities as reality when they are not properly educated. Small things such as casting an African American as a bus driver or a lunch lady or a janitor, or even leaving African Americans out of American themed campaigns causes misinformation in children who are not educated properly about the realities of minority situations in America. Children are easily influenced, whether for good or for bad, but it's more challenging to change the minds of full grown adults. Now, colorism, palatability, and normalization aren't words that we typically use every day. But for African Americans, our lives are impacted by these words all the time. If we want more positive representation of African Americans in broadcast television, other than chocolate commercials, we have to start somewhere. There are three things that I believe will help change this unusual and underrated problem in our society. The first step is education. We have a huge responsibility to educate ourselves about what we don't know. While everything or while everyone may not be able to take a college course about race, there are so many good websites or there are so many good resources such as websites like checkyourblindspot.org created by two of my very good friends and advertising majors here at BYU or commercials like The Talk from Procter & Gamble, even documentaries like 13th from Aubrey DuVernay, a prestigious film director. These are excellent places to start for educating ourselves. These three things cover a variety of different topics regarding race and the history and impact of colorism and different systems in American society. The second way that we can elicit change in our society is through understanding. Listening is an amazing way to seek understanding. I personally have dozens of stories of precarious racial situations just in my four years at BYU, never mind my entire life. Imagine others just like me, even older, who have other stories that they want to share. There are so many good community and campus events that we can attend to help educate ourselves and help listen to the different stories that people have. People are waiting for eye-opening or for, for individuals with open minds to share their experiences. The third and perhaps the most important thing of all that we can do is be willing to be uncomfortable. This might sound a little strange, but discomfort is an important part of the process of change. It means growth. In order to eradicate all ignorance, we must be willing to be uncomfortable. When, not if, but when a friend, coworker, or family member makes a crude joke about race, don't laugh. Use your relationship with them as a way to teach them and yourself. If it made you uncomfortable, even if you're not sure why, say something. Small actions like this help ease you into the discomfort of speaking out in public settings, such as work meetings or classrooms. These changes won't happen all at once. In fact, I hope they don't. The more people, excuse me, the more people that learn and experience colorism and misrepresentation firsthand, the more knowledge on how to improve these situations and issues will spread and the better off we will be as a society. We, I believe that we will be better able to understand the world of media we consume and how it affects our friends, neighbors, and coworkers. There is no short answer, but recognition leads to change. It's tempting to believe that in the future, things will just get better. But the reality is there is no future without the present. So act now. Thank you. Thank you, Egypt. I had to unmute myself. <laughs> That's great. I think that we should take questions for Egypt now. Since we are on this topic, we're going to be uh, switching. So what we will do is um, everybody can unmute themselves if they want to talk. And also I will be watching the um, group chat on the side there because if, I know that some people might have problems with the sound. So um, are there before I have at least one question for Egypt. Are there others who have questions before I jump in?
Okay, so Professor Mason has a question. Says, you mentioned that the government instituted a brown paper bag test. What government was that and for what purpose? So I know, I don't know all the details, I probably should, but in specifically in the South and during, um, it was definitely used during the early 50s and late, late, early to late 50s and 60s, but it was just used to keep people down. So there were other tests similar to it, such as the pencil test. So a lot of people, they were forced to run a pencil through their hair to see if you know, their hair was straight enough. So they would be considered acceptable in society. But it was just in America, definitely, but definitely in the South, the brown paper bag was, the brown paper bag test was used a lot in, in situations where African Americans were forced to present themselves. All right, thank you. Other questions? Okay, maybe I'll ask my question and then see if it sparks others. So I have a friend who is white. She adopted uh, a number of children who are of different ethnicities. Many of them are African-American. And I noticed that when she was giving me a thumbs up when we were texting, that she was using a different color of, for the thumb. It was a darker color, darker skin color. And it made me think, oh, maybe she's doing that because why is it that the lighter colors for the thumbs up is the norm? Because that's what it's set at in our phones. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I started to use that. I use a different color too, something that was sort of in between. Anyway, I just wondered what your thoughts were on that um, with these sorts of aspects of social media and uh, even within Zoom, right? That is a very good question. And I do think it comes down to personal preference and what you feel you're comfortable with. And I, similar, I, similarly, I have always had a problem with the fact that, you know, the pale color is the, is the default setting. And even within the family emojis, you can't change their skin color, you know? So what type of messages, what type of message are we sending through even family emoticons. But going back to your question with the different color thumbs up or the different color, you know, clapping hands, it just, if you feel comfortable portraying a certain skin color, then that's your prerogative. But it is important to be respectful of who you're texting and what the um, situation is. But yeah, it's, it definitely comes down to comfort level and what you feel is appropriate in that situation. All right. Um, okay, so Pam sent in a question. What do you think the black community should do because of colorism and upbringings? Definitely, that is a very good question. And like I said, growing up, I didn't understand the implications of colorism. And I think it's a very underrated problem that not a lot of people discuss, especially within the African American community and different communities. There are so many things that, that can be hurtful. For instance, I, I have personally been told by other African Americans that, oh, you, you you talk like a white person you know and so just just equating the way that i talk to being white equals to being better you know just different things like that are very harmful within the black community and i think like i mentioned education is so important we have to help older african americans understand that colorism is real and that there's not tra okay tradition is very important in the african-american community or within black communities and sometimes people might think that what they're saying is just you know that's just what black people say but it can still be harmful so just educating is very important and i think that's the first step because when we understand what issues these problems or this colorism presents then we're able to address it and be more mindful of our own actions. Hmm. How do I recommend educating the older generation? 
That is a good question. It is hard because there is a fine line between saying something and speaking your mind and being disrespectful. But I think personal stories and personal impact goes a long way. And so as long as you feel comfortable sharing how a phrase has affected you or has impacted your feelings, then I think that's a good place to start. But of course, I don't know all the answers, but I think, yeah, education and, and personal stories telling the older generation. Great, thank you. Okay, we have time for one more question. Does anybody have another question? So I have a question as well. Um, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't want to get maybe too much into like the political side, but I mean, surely there's still some things that need to be done politically with this, this topic. But I guess, what do you think are maybe some of the next like major issues or topics that should be handled politically within the US or in other countries in the world? I, that's a good question because there is a lot of work to be done. And I think there have, there are very good steps being taken right now. And the representation has gotten a lot better even within the past few years. But I think um, one of, one of my favorite film directors, Jordan Peele, I love the way that he does movies because he takes into consideration the skin color of his actors. And some people might think, well, that's racist, that's discriminatory. But if you think about in the past, the way that people of color have been excluded from the media, in a way, it's just catching up to what has been done in the past and allowing for opportunities for people of color, specifically those with dark skin, to express their talents. And so I think when, if we as young adults educate ourselves now, then when we enter our respective fields, we will be better able to address these issues that come up and so like i said that it's not going to be a quick fix it's definitely going to take years and time and patience and pain but there is there is a way to get past it and that, and that's educating ourselves and then being willing to act on that education so that in the future we can impact in a bigger way great thank you egypt i think it's a it's such an important uh, part of our society and uh, race relations because images have such a big impact on how we uh, view other people and what kind of implicit biases then end up in our brains, right? And, and then make uh, have the impact on the decisions we make in split seconds in other aspects. So. Great. Okay. So we're going to um, take a moment now to go and watch Cameron. I think, she, yeah, she's the one that's next, right? Cameron Abila's uh, presentation about the Messiah and Christianity. So what we'll do is um, I'm just going to pause the recording and then we'll have, um, uh, and then I'll give you some more instructions. So we'll just Okay. Hi, I'm Cameron Abilla, um, and for the Africana Studies Symposium, I submitted my paper titled The Mass and Christianity. So I have just a few slides of just some main points, um, but I'm going to be reading my paper. Um, okay. The Maasai people of East Africa have a history of spiritual beliefs that carry them as a people in every aspect of their lives. The idea of God and other mystical beings in the Maasai belief system stem from nature and social and familiar relations. Maasai beliefs in folklore, ritual, prophets, prayer, and God attach meaning to everyday aspects of life. Using writings from Durkheim and Gertz, we see that religion is both a foundation for societies and a cultural system, and for these reasons, Changes influencing Maasai life, such as the introduction and culture of Christianity, impact its intimate aspects of life while not changing the essence of these beliefs that have been passed down for centuries. Okay. 
The Maasai are semi-nomadic cattle herding people located today in the Rift Valley in Kenya and northern Tanzania. The Maasai believe in one god called Nagai, though there are alternative spellings such as Nkai and Ngai. Sometimes they call him male, sometimes female. When he is kind and propitious, they call him the black god. When he is angry, the red god. Sometimes they call him rain, since this is a particularly pleasing manifestation of God, but he is always the one true God. While both genders are encompassed in God, she is mostly spoken of as female because of fertility. The Maasai are the chosen people of God and therefore have the right to all cattle. The study of religion encompasses a myriad of theories and books throughout time regarding peoples from every corner of the earth. Durkheim sought to show that society is the foundation of religion using totemism. Totemism is a belief, is a system of belief in which people are believed to have a kinship or mystical relationship with a spirit being, usually a plant or animal. Durkheim uses totems to describe symbols that represent both God and society. He wrote, totemism is not the religion of certain animals, certain men, or certain images, it is the religion of a kind of anonymous and impersonal force that is identifiable in each of these beings, but identical to none of them. None possesses it entirely, and all participate in it. Such is its independence from the particular subjects in which it is incarnated, that it both precedes and outlives them. The individuals die, the generations pass on, and are replaced by others, but this force remains always present, alive, and the same. It animates the generations of today as it animated those of yesterday and will animate those of tomorrow. God is a force independent of his people for the Maasai, and other totems are present in their belief system. Trees, plants, milk, and grass have mystical powers. These totems include the fig tree, which is a place of worship and prayer. My Maasai friend Lataika says, if there's any problem with one's wife, cattle, or need for rain, one goes first to the fig tree and prays. God hears the people through trees, and for this reason they pray under them. One may also go to the mountain of God, which is a volcano. One goes to the mountain, and if you go there and pray, the gods hear your prayer if the mountain erupts. You then slaughter the animal, a goat or sheep, on top of the mountain. These ecological totems are present in their lives and worshipped generously. According to Durkheim, totems have a physical nature, but also a moral nature. When asked why one follows religious rites, one may answer that their ancestors have always done so and their example must be followed. If he conducts himself with totemic beings in this or that way, it is not only because the forces that reside in them are inaccessible and forbidding in a physical sense, but also because he feels morally obligated so to conduct himself. He feels he is obeying a sort of imperative, fulfilling a duty. Totemism is directly linked to social relations and kinship. While many have criticized the relevancy of Durkheim's findings regarding religious life, his studies deal with lasting principles of the Maasai way. There is a chain of leadership in the Maasai through ancestors, and behavior or Maasai-ness is passed down. Every 20 years is considered a generation, and with it comes a prophet chosen by leaders through one's ancestry. This man chosen is a prophet similar to Jesus for the Christians. They are chosen by God. Lataika commented that if his prophet told him to stop his studies and travel to a certain place, he would do so without question. Spencer wrote, diviners become prophets. Each tribal section has their own unkidongi prophet. Respect for him is mingled with fear. He protects his clients from sorcerers through a more potent form of sorcery and he may withdraw this protection if they do not reward him or try to desert him. This prophet is full of magic and knowledge chosen at birth to lead his generation. Durkheim also wrote on societies and their division of labor. A low division of labor leads to religion because it creates a collective consciousness and a weak individual consciousness. This collective consciousness, in other words, is effervescence, the feeling one gets when they do things collectively as a group. These acts make you stronger than the sum of your parts. The Maasai with their prophets, stemming from kin relations, create a collective consciousness and make the solidarity within their belief system stronger. Thus, their religion is in fact a cultural system. Gertz wrote, wrote on this topic, 
defining cultural system as a historically transmitted pattern of meanings embodied in symbols, a system of inherited conceptions expressed in symbolic forms by means of which men communicate, perpetuate, and develop their knowledge about and attitudes toward life. If religion is a system of symbols that give meaning to one's life, religion is a cultural system full of meaning and effervescence. Folklore and oral histories place a huge part in the Maasai community and their beliefs and, collect and collective consciousness. Since cattle are their way of life, stories regarding the origin of cattle are some of the most well-known. The Maasai believe Nagai, God, gave them all the cattle in the world when the earth and sky split at the beginning of time. This is how the Maasai have justified raiding cattle from other peoples in the past. Nagai delivered cattle to the Maasai through the roots of the wild fig tree, thus making it sacred and a way to pray to God. Folklore also is a way to continue tradition through speaking of the way elders wish to be viewed and view themselves. As a result of this particular oral history, any pursuit other than herding cattle makes Maasai less than a Maasai. Dr. Kokel Malubo gave a lecture in which he explained how when the government required one child of each Maasai family to go to school, being sent away from the cattle to go to school was a punishment for the troubled children. Troubled. Malubo was chosen for school and in the end loved his education. He went on to high school and college and with each year of education was viewed by his people as less Maasai. This is the trade-off he chose. While he continues to be proud of being Maasai, he is somehow less Maasai than his siblings who stayed in their Boma. While the Maasai have continued to practice their ways of life and their belief system, changes such as Christianity being introduced affect the Maasai but have not taken precedent over their core beliefs. Lataika told me once how Christian missionaries came to his village and taught his mother. She liked what they said enough to be baptized a Christian. But once the missionaries left, she went right back to praying to the fig tree. He laughed while relating this to me, further showing how deeply ingrained these beliefs are. The fig tree is a direct conduit to speak to God, and no missionary can change that. Missionary Vincent Donovan wrote on his experience bringing Christianity to groups of the Maasai and how his experience caused him to have to rediscover his own faith. He wrote, there was no area of Maasai life that was not touched by their traditional religion, and now they saw Christianity continuing and fulfilling this process. Their entire life was sacramental, filled with effective signs as real as the things they symbolized. There was no way I could tell them that Christianity was less than that. I could not leave any gaps in their lives, vacuums to be filled by the reservoir of paganism surrounding them. Christianity had to be as all-embracing and pervasive as the paganism it was replacing and fulfilling. In seeing this for them, I began to see it for myself as well. This particular passage is interesting because the author realizes the Maasai way of life with totems as symbols and religion as culture is more present in the life of an everyday man than his current Christian beliefs. Because of the solidarity provided by the Maasai belief system, for a long time, Christians coming into Maasai country did not have much success. The people were not interested and were left alone. Catholics and Protestant Christianity came with the first Maasai Christian school, erected in 1938. The Church of Scotland started the school with the mission to help them be saved. But to the missionaries' regret, the negligible amount of school children used their attained skills to find a job and did not value their acquired Christian knowledge. Converts had to keep certain rules, including addressing each other with Christian names, exchanging their clothes for pants and skirts, and ending, ending practices essential to Maasai tradition, such as polygamy and circumcision. The idea evolved then that education belonged to white Christians and they could go to school if they converted. Eventually, when the government required schooling, this idea persisted as shown in Malubo's case of school being a punishment. He said, the more education, the less valuable you become to the society. Since I am here, I have become an occasional visitor to my village. The more educated you become, the more you detach yourself with your people. Going to school means you become less Maasai. The way I eat, what I eat, even the way I think is less Maasai. All of this makes me less Maasai, and I might think I am more global, but not good enough to be Maasai. 
While some Maasai converted, many wore Western style clothes, except for during ceremonies where they put on traditional wear again. When asked what kept Christian Maasai apart now that they had converted, they said the Ma language and their bracelets and ornaments would keep them apart as Maasai people. Though Christianity came and many never converted, the culture of Christianity did take effect on the people over time. Education came first from the Christians and now is a government requirement. Many current names are Christian in origin, and Malubo spoke on this. He said, I've tried to name every child, including myself and my wife, Maasai names. No Christian names. We are all proudly Maasai. While through the introduction of Christianity, Maasai have adopted certain ways of life considered to be Western, they did not assimilate with it entirely. Considering their inner self, their moral values, they are still Maasai. This goes back to Latika's example of his mother converting, but going right back to what she had always known. Religion truly is the foundation for Maasai society. Totems such as the fig tree and mountain of God remain sacred to the people. All participate in these traditional beliefs and they continue to be passed down through the generations. Symbolism through totems dictate Maasai communication, knowledge, and attitudes towards life. While the introduction of Christianity to the Maasai brought many changes throughout the lands in which they live, their beliefs continue to carry them as a people. Even many Maasai who have converted to Christianity continue to be proud of their heritage and show this through the dual nature of their life, incorporating both worlds. Life has changed for many through the influence of Christianity in the Western world, but the reality is the Maasai people are still Maasai, and their belief system continues to be all-embracing and pervasive. Their entire life is sacramental. Here's my bibliography. <laughs> Okay, thank you. All right, I hope everybody got to watch Cameron's really interesting presentation. She's not here to answer any questions. Um, if anybody has some comments, they're welcome to share with, uh, with us now. I just, one thing that struck me is in African history, uh, there's a lot of work done on how Christianity has been merged with uh, African African beliefs or worldviews, and I think that was a, a good example of how that happened with the Maasai, and uh, we can see the, the differences there, which is something that you've, uh, we see across the continent, which makes African Christianities very interesting and dynamic uh, religions to study. Any other comments or, or anything anybody wants to add to that? Oh, I would say one more thing that you could see, she had two people she was drawing on, uh, she interviewed them, uh, Latika and then Dr. Malubo, and both of those people were people she knew from the College of African Wildlife Management, which she met on a study abroad program. So it's really great that people can have those opportunities. Okay, let's go ahead and hear from Drew, Drew Bales. Um, am I saying that correctly, Drew? Um, Bales. Bayless, okay. I just, as I said it, I thought, oh, I think I might be messing it up. No, Thank no. you for correcting me. Okay, so Drew um, is a major, a computer science major, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. right. And combining that with an Africana Studies minor, so I think there will be some really interesting things that Drew's going to do in the future. Uh, and uh, so we're going to hear his paper uh, about Islamic reform in Northern Nigeria. All right, it's all you. Awesome. So my slides are, they're rather simple, but they will, they have some maps that hopefully will be able to um, help you all to emit, like picture the things that I'm discussing um, as I focus on Nigeria and Islamic reform and how Islamic reform in the 18th century later um, had effects that led to the civil war um, recently in Nigeria and into the political structure today. So, modern perspectives of African nations fail to show any amount of the true history and core values that they are made of. Analyzing their history and considering the influences that played a role in developing each nation can prove to be an insightful experience, especially when considering the effects of colonization. 
Political systems are typically tied closely to the economic and social structures of a nation. If a greater understanding of the history of a nation's political system is considered over a period of time, economic and social changes and their respective causes can be observed. In the pre-colonized region of what is now Northern Nigeria, a deeper understanding of the effects that Islamic reform had on the region's political system will provide a deeper understanding of why British colonization had the effects that it did and to what extent it continues to influence Nigeria's political system today. Modern Nigeria is predominantly Muslim with about 50% 50, 50 of the population de declaring to be Muslim. Although Islamic religion came to neighboring empires first, the, pre the strong presence of Islamic faith in the House of States of Northern Nigeria has its earliest recorded ties dating to the late 14th century with the arrival of the Wangarawa. The Wangarawa was a group of traders and scholars from Mali that were led by Abd ar Rahman Zagaiti to the Northern Nigerian town of Kano, and over time began to occupy positions in the local courts. Their influence on the town and the local government became strong and led to the establishment of Islam as the religion of the court. This Islamic dominance of the court, however, did not mean that pre-Islamic faiths were non-existent in the region. Over time, with the help of multiple scholars, Islam became widely accepted in the region by all classes of individuals. This wide acceptance led to a mixing of certain aspects of Islam and pre-Islamic faiths. As a result, only certain aspects of Islam were fully accepted or widely understood. As described, Islam was accepted by all, seen by those who never practiced it, in the sense that they believed in its power and sought its blessings in such forms as amulets and charms. This lax acceptance of Islam would lead to the topics of unity and the revitalization of Islam to be some of the great issues of Muslims in the northern region. This would eventually lead to the later significant reformist holy war, Jihad, led by Usman Dan Fodio in the early 19th century. Usman Dan Fodio was a Fulani preacher. The Fulani originated as cattle nomads in present day Senegal and migrated to the Hausa states in the 15th century. As they were an active Muslim society, they had great amounts of exposure to and knowledge of Islamic culture. Over short amounts of time, Similar to the Wangarawa, the Fulani began to rise to important positions in the, local, in the courts and gain political power over the local Hausa kings. Tensions were naturally building as the Hausa kings were exercising harsh power over all others under their rule. The Fulani at this time began to be unsettled by the differences in adherence to Islamic law, mainly between the more passive Hausa and themselves. It was the Fulani who first decided to rebel on the ground of Islamic reform against the Hausa kings. This rebellion occurred at a good time and quickly gained popularity, popularity among Muslims and non-Muslims. The previous tensions that arose from unjust leadership in the Hausa states attracted the attention of typical working class citizens. Jihadists wisely referenced the Sharia as the basis for their evolution, which was effective from both ethnic and social viewpoints. The Sharia states that it is unjust for Islamic kings to unreasonably tax people, such as what was occurring to the Fulani nomads who were rural cattle breeders in the region. Islamic kings were also not supposed to enslave prisoners at will, which they were doing. The 1804 Jihad of Usman Danforio was different than any previous religion, religious revivalist movements in the region. Up until, the, up until this time, a war with comparable social and religious tensions had not occurred in the region. The Holy War lasted roughly five years and concluded with the formation of the Sokoto Caliphate. Uh, let's see here, there. As successfully established under the direction of Usman Don Fodio, it successfully incorporated 15 neighboring states. In the end, the House of Kings were replaced by the royal Fulani families. Under their rule, the reform style of government was corrupt. And in many ways, this corruption was similar to the, to the corruption of the Nigerian government throughout the 20th century and today. Usman Danforio's fundamental belief that political positions should be given only by blood relationship and not by appointment was not being practiced. Fodio's brother wrote about the new royalty whose purpose is the ruling of countries and the collecting of concubines and fine clothes. 
Despite the revolts beginning to rise against the royalty, the empire quickly had to unite and shift its focus to a series of attacks from outside of the empire. The only commonality that could bind the young empire together amidst ethnic tensions was their common faith, Islam. Thus, the Hazafalani worked to create a new identity centered, centered on a theocratic political system. Before considering the impact that British colonization had on the political state of northern Nigeria, it is important to realize that the Sokoto Empire deserves a great deal of credit for the modern day development of Muslim communities in northern Nigeria. The social and economic structures that existed within these Hausa societies still remains active within modern societies in the region. Economically, the Hausa are known for having broad and complex systems of markets and trade. In rural areas, markets typically ran on three to four day cycles, whereas in urban centers, markets were active daily. Market officials were appointed to oversee disputes and issues. These officials follow traditional logistics of Hausa ranked hierarchy. Business was typically managed through verbal agreements. The complex system that drew in diverse markets, traders, and families from both rural and urban locations was responsible for binding the state internally and also externally through trade. These systems are still in strong existence today in the Northern region among the Hausa and neighboring groups. Similarities among the social organization that arose from the Hausa Fulani period and modern times also exist. Family is central to the hierarchy of Muslim Hausa societies. Children, especially sons, are expected to follow their parents' counsel of direction. The roles of men during the Hausa Fulani period typically included serving as head of household, fulfilling agricultural needs, marketing, laundry, and transportation. Roles of women were centered more around the house with activities such as cooking, cleaning, and utilizing craft skills. Women were also subject to stay at home unless taken out by a male family member. These societies were heavily reliant upon male rule and sustained the image of men exhibiting calmness and solidarity. These societal gender standards that were important to the Hausa and Fulani from before the 1804 Jihad are still strongly present today in the social structure of Northern Nigeria as well. Before British colonization of Northern Nigeria in 1903, several, ways of explore, several waves of explorers with different tasks were sent to the region. Until 1830, it was unknown to Europeans that almost all of the oil rivers responsible for producing and transporting highly needed palm oil were connected to the Niger River itself. Palm oil became a necessity for Europeans as the development of machinery required the oil as lubricant. Before this time, however, the Europeans were only able to get oil through a middleman system that closely mimicked the system used under slavery. In 1830, two explorers known as the Lander Brothers successfully sailed down the river from Busa, as seen on the map, a settlement in northwestern Nigeria to the sea. This new discovery of the interior river system quickly gained popularity abroad. In, in October 1832, MacGregor Laird and Richard Lander historically arrived on the Niger coast and made the first direct commercial contact between Europeans and Africans in the Niger Valley. As they excitedly entered the valley where the Sokoto Empire resides, with high hopes of reorganizing local trade, their joy quickly dim diminished as they observed the state of revolution and civil unrest that existed. From the reformist movement of Usman Dan Folio in 1806, the Sokoto Empire was still forming its new Hausa Fulani centered identity in 1832, as Laird observed. Among early efforts of the British to establish a West African economic and political policy in the early 19th century, it is difficult to say just how much these attempts were stunted by the effects of the religious reform at the head of the century. Other hindrances that the British faced early on were disease, ethnic issues outside of the Sokoto Empire, and general uncertainty of policy from within. Towards the latter half of the 19th century, toward trade along the Niger grew extremely competitive with flooding amounts of private European trading companies coming to the region. Sir George Goldie of England had a possible solution to this problem. He believed that overcompetition was the disease and monopoly the only cure. With the creation of the United African Company in 1879, although with no support from the British government, 
Goldie's pathway to political power and eventually a royal charter began. In 1886, his company was chartered as the Royal Niger Company and gave the British a full monopoly on the lower Niger River. This charter helped the British fight off competition from Germany and gave the government one of a series of major economical establishments in the modern Nigeria, Nigerian region. These crucial advances catalyzed the process of British colonization. Shortly afterwards, in 1903, the British sent troops and colonized the Sokoto Empire with only minor resistance. However, the British were hesitant in completely destroying the existing theocratic system and expelling the Fulani royalty. Under Islamic rule, the people were paying taxes and were accustomed to obeying officials. The British viewed the existing system as functional and simply lacked the men needed to fully supply an administrative staff of their own. Thus, the reformed Islamic society and government of the Sokoto Empire in the north led the British to establish an indirect government system centered in northern Nigeria that was completely different from what they had previous, previously established in other African colonies. They agreed to leave the Sharia or Muslim law as the basis of the judicial system in the region all throughout the colony's existence. The British did, however, add a few exceptions to this, such as reserving the right to modify the Sharia under any circumstance and abolishing practices similar to, similar to torture and mutilation. Although they simply tried to maintain the upper hand in this indirect colony, their actions of interpreting the Sharia and trying to tell Muslims what is just or unjust continues to offend many Muslims to this day. It must not be forgotten that under colonial rule, the government highly favored Muslims from a judicial standpoint. Fulani judges who followed, followed the Sharia would not allow non-Muslims to testify against Muslims, and the penalty for murder differed largely between Muslims and non-Muslims. Even the spreading of Christianity was banned inside the Sokoto region, as the colonial office stated, whatever threatened the Mohammedan religion threatened the authority of the emirs and so imperiled their organization of indirect rule. A division even arose among the British officials regarding religion as it relates to the colonization of Nigeria. Islam was more favorably believed to be capable of producing much more civilized governments and citizens than Christianity. Important colonial figures such as Frederick Lugard held these beliefs. Suedo scientific beliefs also led many to admire the House of Fulani for their anatomical features. Lady Lugard stated, the high nose, the thin lips, and deep set eye, the aristocratic thin hand, the ruling classes in the North are deserving in every way of the name of cultivated gentlemen. There are races which are born to conquer and others to, persist, to persist in conquest. Hence, it is no wonder why today the government of Nigeria continues to have heavy Islamic influence. This early ethnic and religious division also proved to lay the foundation for the later Biafran civil war. Such admiration may have proved beneficial to the House of Fulani during colonization, but the long-term negative effects are still present today. Christian missions brought with them Western culture, schools, and hospitals. The Sultan of Sokoto himself taught his people that Western education de destroys our culture. While aiming to protect their pillars of faith, they, they failed to fully consider the negative potential effects this might have on the standard of living of their posterity. The absence of Christian missions in northern Nigeria later caused significant poverty and underdevelopment. In 1957, just 185,000 children in northern Nigeria attended primary school when compared to 2.3 million in the south. Consider if the Islamic reform of the north in 1806 had instead failed and resulted in the formation of several decentralized communities with no religious commonality. The British strategy of colonizing northern Nigeria and eventually all of Nigeria would have gone completely different. The Islamic influence of the Sokoto Empire thus had direct influence on the British in forming political and religious policy of the colony. Even until Nigeria gained independence in 1960, the legacies of Usman Danforio and the Sokoto Empire were still relevant to the development of the nation, especially within the Muslim communities. Many leaders such as Amadou Bello the first prime minister of the northern region and other influential figures claim their relation to Fodio as a means to gain political popularity. Abu Bakar Gumi, leader of the Yan Izala revivalist movement in 1978, 
gave all credit to Usman Danforio for his success. The late 1960s marked a time of restructuring in Nigeria. Amadou Bello rose to be the leader of the North's most dominant party, the NPC, Northern People's Congress, during the 1950s and would stay throughout the 1960s. He took it upon himself to foster and ensure that Northern Nigeria remained the way that it had been under Usman Danforio's policies. As the NPC's candidate for the office of prime minister, he decided not to run, but instead to stay and exclusively, exclusively represent just the North. At the same time, Abubakar Tafawa Beliwa was once again appointed as prime minister by the British governor with the objective of forming a federal government to end the transitional state of the government. Baliwa and Be Bello had a close-knit relationship and would sometimes playfully reference their relationship to that of the historical Sultan of Sokoto and Emir of Bauchi. Bello quickly noticed that much of the administrational formats in the North reflected the system instilled by the British under indirect rule. Thus, Bello's work was to modernize the system of power to fit in with his plans, but also to revitalize Usman Danforio's fundamental religious and political ideas that had been altered. While Bello and Baliwa's agenda was to religiously reunite the North and progress towards political dominance, opposition quickly arose, settling such progress. In 1966, Amadou Bello was murdered and progress towards a civil war was moving rapidly as the North immediately lost its position towards political dominance. Underneath all of these conflicts that led up to the, to the civil war was religion. Not to say that religion was the only contributing factor, but the Christians of the Southern states often explicitly ex opposed the opinions of the North on political and economic issues. As the Muslims began to see a formation of a religious neutral state following the death of Amadou Bello, leaders in the North persistently advocated for unity among Muslims to oppose this. After all, after all this is what the traditions of their fathers and their faith have taught them to do. Conversely, in the South, the Christians held core values of denying unjust oppression and support of a greater sense of integrity, especially in economic negotiations. Some Muslims in the late 1980s blamed Amadou Bello, Bello for his restructuring as the cause for their downfall, while others believed a second jihad was necessary to fix the problems and restore a, the state back to the way the house of states were before the first jihad. As seen, studying political systems of a nation over time can prove to be eye-opening and insightful in unexpected ways. The House of Fulani War of the, ninth, of the early 19th century that led to Islamic reformation and the establishment of the Sokoto Empire was critical in the development of, modern, of the modern-day state of Nigeria. Politically, the close-knit Islamic state ties that, ties that developed under the Sokoto Empire continued to influence the development of the nation even after the post-colonial civil war. Socially and economically, the North's close ties with Islam and the refusal by the British to send westernizing missionaries to the North during colonial, colonialism proved to hurt the North and segregate it from the South in the long term. Differences in education and social services are drastically present in modern times. How's a familial hierarchy and complex trade systems still exist and thrive? Conflict among Muslims among the Muslims in the North and the Christians in the South also continue to negatively affect trade in modern times as well. More insight as to why the British chose to govern the Nigerian colony in the ways that they did was also uncovered. Finally, a full synthesis was able to be seen as more recent leaders such as Amadou Bello and their opinions on how the Islamic reform should still be incorporated within modern politics was analyzed. While Nigeria's political system may be just as complex as that of other states, its modern identity, which stems largely from 19th century Islamic reform, is what makes it truly unique. All right, thank you, Drew. Yes, applause. Um, okay, so uh, I think that we can um, ask Drew some questions. So those of you who just joined us, we, uh, we're, we kind of changed the order a little bit and got a little bit of a late start, so we still have one more presentation, but I think it would be good to pause here to ask Drew some questions, and then I see that Cam uh, joined us, and so maybe Cam would like to take some questions as well. We can, again, you can do it through your microphone or your video, or you can type in your question 
um, over to in the in the group chat. So I see we have a question from Dr. Mason. Did you do this research for a particular class? And I missed that. How does this research fit into your larger education here? Good question. Yeah, that's a great question. So actually, last semester I was taking the modern history class taught by uh, Dr. Hatfield. So we had to do a, a term paper, just pick anything um, in Africa that we wanted to to learn more about, um, kind of like change over time, or kind of talking talking about like maybe media and stuff and. Um, I don't know. I just really was interested in in Nigeria and learning more. I've heard I heard about the Biafran civil war, and I wanted to know more, um, especially about the north too. I had some companions on my mission, one from um, Plateau State up in the north, and I also had another companion from he's an Igbo from the south. So I heard both of their different perspectives. You know, they would talk to me all day about uh, just about Nigeria. So um, it really interested me, and I was able to to learn more about it. And I hope I can go there someday, but probably not to BYU. <laughs> Great. Any other questions? I have a question, Drew, while other people might be thinking of one. Um, the different education that was, the different education systems that developed in the North versus the South, I mm -hmm. think are really important because if I understand correctly, one of the things that drew you to this was also um, the history of explaining Boko Haram into the, in today's world. And uh, that has a lot to do with the education systems in, or lack of education uh, opportunities in the North. Um, but I, so I'm interested in the kind of Islamic education that could have been there though. If you um, had that, I know that, um, I've had friends in other parts of Africa who have grown up both in going to an Islamic school as well as a secular school or one that might have started as a Christian mission school. So mm -hmm. I wondered if you, uh, how that might have featured into your research. That's interesting, actually. I didn't find too much at least about like, you know, the, the different like specific education um, systems, but it just seems like that definitely the the systems that were brought in like to the Christian missions were, were definitely more developed. Um, of course, like they were centered on different principles and such. But that's definitely something that's very interesting too. I would like to, to actually learn more about that. Maybe I can do another, uh, do some a little more research on that and maybe do another, maybe another paper or something else, another project on that. But that's also, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah, for sure. Um, something for me to think about, I guess. So. Great, maybe. thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Hey, uh, I've got a question. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, it was really interesting. Uh, you, you talked about the Lugards, Frederick Lugard and, Lugard and his, his wife. Mm -hmm. um, and you said something I thought was interesting about how, uh, and correct me if I'm getting this wrong or remembering this wrong, but they, they characterized one group, I don't remember which one, if it was the Fulani, as, as being uh, kind of more suited to rule. Uh, just they're, they're sort of character suggests that they were kind of i don't know better or better rulers or or what how did you put it or how did she put it do you remember yeah yeah i, I have it up right now she, she was talking about like the high nose the thin lips the yeah high the aristocratic thin hands yeah she's talking about the uh the hausa oh the hausa okay yeah so i think that's really interesting the 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 ways in which european colonizers sometimes kind of imposed uh kind of western ideas about class mm -hmm. on uh, African groups in Kenya, uh, um, Isaac Dennison in her book Out of Africa talks about how the Maasai are like the are, are very regal, kind of similarly, right? They have this very sort of aristoc aristocratic quality to them, uh, whereas the Kikuyu are like the the lower classes of of Europe. Um, and I just wonder, uh, and I realize this wasn't kind of necessarily the point of the whole presentation, but that stood out to me. And I, I wonder, do you have any additional thoughts on, I don't know, the implications of uh, I don't know, characterizing, of the colonialists kind of characterizing um, different uh, communities of people in terms of uh, European ideas of class? Yeah, for sure. That makes sense, yeah. Yeah, this is something that, that was a great question. This is something that actually was pretty big. Um, I definitely could have gone a little more into it, but it definitely led into, like, it, it has, like, some major repercussions and such, and, I mean, there's also... Um, 
like in, in Rwanda, I know we learned about, a lot about that as well. And in, in, in Congo, what the Belgians did, it's, it's also like this kind of similarities. But it all comes back to just the, the, the lack of understanding of culture and, you know, trying to, trying to accept them for who they were, which is, which is what happened largely in colonialism. Um, and it definitely, it's something that is, if we, over, if we overlook it, I think it will like, kind of hinder us in trying to understand things. Like that's why when, as I kept doing this research, it kept kind of pointing back to how they treated these, um, the Hausa like sp special because yeah. of just yeah. these things they believed and then it had big effects. And so it's definitely something that if we can find evidence and find like real evidence of it existing, it, it can prove insightful. And then, like, I, I only found a few implications. I'm sure that there's a much more yep. uh, that can be found, but it's, it's certainly huge for sure. Yeah, yeah, great, thank you. It would be interesting also to see at that time, so we're looking late 19th century, right? How some of those ideas might've affected how Americans are looking at each other. And it, in a way it kind of uh, connects to what Egypt was talking about earlier. These different ideas about how the physical appearance, I mean, this, pseudo-scientific racism that we see there definitely I think was around the world moving yeah. around the world yeah yeah that's really interesting okay any other questions for Drew how about questions for Cameron anybody have questions for Cam she just joined us We, um, Cam, just to give, uh, bring you up to speed, we watched your presentation and then I made some comments about, um, well, I didn't put it this way, but the resiliency of African culture and yet how it gets uh, combined with other things that come into it. Um, maybe Cam, if, if it works, I would ask you a um, question about you, you've got Dr. Malubo and Lataika, who both were highly educated, um, and you, you quote them, and there's this relationship between being Maasai and being educated. Um, and then you had pictures from the uh, visit to the Maasai village, and I, I wondered, or this Maasai Boma is kind of how they call it there. Um, what do you think about the people who are in that village? How, how much do you think that they uh, interact with um, other educated people? Or did, did you get a chance to talk to them at all about those people who are there and what their interactions with, I don't want to say outside world because it makes them seem like they're so isolated, but I guess that's kind of what I'm asking. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, well, the Boma that we visited, I know, is like a tourist place, mm -hmm. and so that's definitely different. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I mean, the the dwellings they sh or their houses that they showed us and and stuff like that, I know is is like a real representation, but I don't know to what extent, you know. Um, and then, yeah, the only Maasai people that I was able to talk with and got to know were from the college, so they were college educated. So I just, I don't have a very um, broad understanding, I guess. But from what I was able to find out, I thought it was interesting. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, can I ask one again? Yeah. Um, Cameron, uh, yeah, I thought that was really interesting. I actually served my mission in East Africa. It was technically the Ken Kenya Nairobi mission, but I never got a chance to serve there. But um, okay. I was in Uganda and Ethiopia, but uh, the church was really growing in Kenya and has since grown quite a lot. And I just wonder if you know, or if anybody else knows, I mean, has the church attempted to uh, work with the Maasai or proselytize to the Maasai at all? Um, I just wonder if, if, if uh, yeah, if, if the LDS Church has, has made any kind of gestures toward the Maasai in, in, the, in the years that they've been there. Um, I don't know about with, with the Maasai. Um, we did go to church in Arusha, and Leslie, no, Leslie knows yeah. all this, but I, I got the 
I talked with one of the missionaries that we met there. It was it was the it was the Nairobi district in Arusha. So, mm -hmm. um, and I asked him like what it was like, and but he'd never mentioned Maasai. I think. Mm. Um, so I I don't know. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, that's okay. That's an interesting, no, that's interesting. question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's very interesting. I am not sure either, but I do know that one of the men I talked to and who uh, talked to my dad quite a bit is, is Maasai, oh, one of the members it. of the church, the church. Yeah, in the Rusha branch. Mm -hmm. So I, but I don't know what his experience was. He was doing tourism like a lot of people do. Yeah, no. yeah it'd be interesting to know. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Thanks, Cam. Oh, go ahead, I, Drew. Um, I don't know. I'm just kind of curious um, for Cameron. Did you find much about like polygamy um, in your research at all? Because I know just when I was there as well, like a lot of mm. the Maasai, they have like their polygamy is a big part of their, their culture, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I just wonder how that plays with, with Christianity. And um, I don't know if you found anything about that or maybe if you didn't go deep into that. I'm just kind of curious. Um, so Dr. Maluo talked to us about his father who has, um, he had uh, seven wives, I think, and, and like up to a hundred children. Um, so, but I know like Dr. Milibo only has one wife. I, I, so polygamy I know is still practiced, but um, I didn't have any personal like connection to it. But I heard, okay. I heard some stories. Okay, okay. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Cam. Okay, so we have a couple of ways we could do this. We could all go watch um, uh, the presentation of Malia um, and then come back together. Or what we could do, which, and this might be a little easier, is that we could uh, announce the awards now, and then you can all go watch Malia's presentation since Malia isn't here. Is there a consensus on what would be good? Anybody have? Okay, Professor Manson says option two. Anybody else have an opinion? So, so does it sound good? We Should we announce the awards and, okay. And then we'll that you can go watch the the video, and then again you can go to the up on the group chat, and I'll maybe I'll just um, post the link again in the group chat, and you can go there and find Malia's video there. Um, so you, every year when we do this, well, it hasn't been every year, but the past few years when we've done the Africana studies. Um, Student Symposium, we have had an opportunity to award students uh, for their great papers, and especially because of the Kwezi Lomso Endowed Fund in Africana Studies, that's where these awards uh, come from. It's uh, made possible by some really generous donors who are helping to support our program. And a, a small committee of members from the Africana Studies Executive Committee reads the papers and decides uh, on the awards. So this year we had four papers um, that were being presented and we decided all of them were great. And so we wanted to give everybody an award. So what we ended up doing is that Malia Robinson got the uh, award for the best paper. And then we had Drew Bayless. Yes, we can clap for Malia. Um, it's a great paper and we'll, we'll all go and hear her present it. And then, uh, then Drew Bayless, right? Is that right, Drew? Okay. <laughs> and then Cameron Nabila and Egypt Bird, uh, we thought all their papers were great. And so we did a three-way tie for the next um, level of papers. And so the first, uh, so we can give them a round of applause to all those great papers. It was really fun to see everybody um, present. You all did a great job and I, I commend you. It's really exciting to see what you're all, you all are doing. And I hope you keep in touch when you finish your minors and we can track you and see what you end up going out there in the world and doing. So Malia, first place got $100 and then everybody else got $50. It feels like a kind of a small amount for all the work that went into this, but you can go treat yourself. 
order in some food or something. <laughs> I don't know, whatever you want to do. Um, or save it for when you can go out later. Uh, so thank you, everybody. The other thing that we have started doing with the Africana Studies Student Symposium is announce uh, the Chantal Thompson Award in Africana Studies. And that is an award for professors or faculty members who make a uh, big contribution to Africana Studies, either the field in and of itself or here at BYU. And this year we've awarded that to Dr. Jacob Rue, uh, who has done excellent work a lot of times he's right there uh, involved in all of the planning of events and Black History Month is usually a, a main thing that he does. And so I wanted to, I, I nominated him and the, the executive committee agreed that um, we really needed to recognize all the work that he did. So um, we ended up as, a, as part of that award, he gets a certificate, yay, <laughs> and then, um, but also uh, some artwork um, and a book of poems um, and, and writings by, um, uh, the artwork comes from Gregory Christie, who is an illustrator who visited campus last year and spoke um, at different places. And so we bought some, a painting, a couple of paintings and some of his books uh, to give to Dr. Rue. So with that, I will end our session here. And thank you everyone again for coming. It was great to see you. And we will, um, I just posted the, the Google Drive there. Um, and uh, you can go and watch Malia's video. And we will also post this uh, video online. And that will make it so that other people who couldn't make it could, can um, watch your presentations and also hear the awards. So thank you everyone again. Uh, just one last. A uh, bit from, I, I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. Um, Dr. Mason uh, suggested go watching season two of the PBS show, No Passport Required. I've heard him, he gave the link there. I've heard him talk about that before. I'm sure there's something very interesting about Northern Nigeria there. And then um, Cam, Cameron also um, said that she looked in her journal and Malubo said, there was one Maasai in the Gorongor crater with 48 wives and his father had seven wives and 53 kids. So yes, there's a, and they have a preferred wife, but no hierarchy of wives. Just wanted to highlight that. Okay, thank you everyone. Enjoy your weekend and take care. Hi, Hi I'm Leah Robinson. I'm going to be presenting my paper on porters on Mount Kilimanjaro. Um, I had the opportunity to go to Tanzania last year and climb Mount Kilimanjaro and it was a life-changing experience for me and so, I really wanted to learn more about the history of porters and their working conditions. So here's my paper. Here. Porters on Mount Kilimanjaro. Mount Kilimanjaro, located on the border of Tanzania and Kenya, is known today as the roof of Africa. Its peak touches the sky at the lofty height of 19,341 feet, making it the highest peak on the African continent, one of the world's largest volcanoes, a world heritage site, the wonder of Africa, and the world's largest freestanding mountain. Mount Kilimanjaro has captured the attention of both adventurers and scholars with its unique characteristics. Countless expeditions have been made by thousands of people to its peak. Despite its staggering height, climbing to the summit is relatively doable and accessible to the average person, as it does not require knowledge of technical mountaineering. However, climbing the colossal mountain is a feat that does require the guidance and support of both guides and porters. In fact, Tanzanian law requires that every climber, that for every climber, there is at least one guide and three porters, all who play a vital role in helping climbers reach the mountain's summit safely. The guides are important because they set the hiking pace for the climbers, help them with any discomfort or question they might have, and provide interesting information about the mountain's unique geography. Because of this, guides tend to develop, a pers tend to develop personal relationships with their climbers and it is not uncommon for friendships to form between climbers and their guides. The porters, on the other hand, do not have the same level of interaction with climbers as the guides. A mountain porter's primary job is to carry all of the climbers' gear during the journey. This includes tents, bedding, clothing, cooking supplies, waste, and all the food and water for the week, etc. They hike faster than the climbers in order to have camp set up and ready when the hikers arrive, and they leave later than the climbers in order to take down the camp the next day. 
Consequently, the porters interact with climbers only occasionally. Perhaps this is why the important role of the mountain porters has been generally unknown to the world. This must change. It is important that people, especially those in the outdoor adventure community, are informed and aware of the porters on Mount Kilimanjaro, and specifically, of the unethical nature of their working conditions so that a change can be made. A porter's job is difficult, tiresome, and critical. Day in and day out, they carry heavy loads on their heads so that climbers can be comfortable while on the mountain. Furthermore, the difficulty of their jobs is exacerbated rather than mitigated by poor working conditions. Porters regularly face harsh and at times extreme weather without the protection of proper gear and clothing. It is common for them to be given only one to two meals a day or for them to work long, hard hours only to receive a meager salary in the end. While climbers tend to give a good tip, corruption in the guides can prevent them from ever receiving the extra money. This reality may seem absurd to foreign climbers, but they witness this reality firsthand as they begin their trek up the mountain. I know that was how it was for me on my trek earlier this year. Since being home, I have sought to understand why porters in the 21st century are still facing these challenges. I have found that these issues are not new, but are rooted in a culture that was formed primarily during the colonial period and have been perpetuated into our present time. Understanding this history will help us to understand how we can help the porters' working conditions improve today. Before the first colonizer, before the first colonizers arrived to Tanganyika, porters were used to transport goods such as ivory and silk for Arab traders. Some of the traders' porters came as freemen. Others came in chose servitude due to dire circumstances, while others were captured and forced to work. Those captured by slave hunters were chained together and forced to walk sometimes hundreds of kilometers. Porters were discriminated against and seen as less than their masters, and it was not uncommon for violence to be used as a way for leaders to establish power. Despite the option of livestock being used as a means to transport goods, porters were chosen as the best form of transportation because um, trypanosomy, trypanosomy, trypanosomy <laughs> carried by the tsetse fly killed domestic animals, including oxen, donkeys, horses, and mules. Yet interactions with foreigners exposed African porters to many new diseases that would kill as many as an entire caravan or half a village. When the Europeans began to arrive, smallpox proved to be especially fatal. Few that contracted the disease survived. Because the caravan was always moving, the porters would carry the, these diseases to other nations. A doctor by the name of E.J. Salin lived among the Nyamwenzi during this time. He stated, the average life of males did not exceed 20 to 25 years. Great numbers fell victim to epidemics. Despite the traders' attempts to choose a transportation method that was less prone to disease, the porters were still greatly affected by it. By the time the first European laid eyes on Mount Kilimanjaro, porters had been utilized for many years. The first European to see Mount Kilimanjaro was a German missionary named Johannes Bredman in 1848. The missionary turned explorer when he took a caravan of 30 porters and an umbrella and set out to reach the summit. Ultimately, he was unable to reach the summit due to illness and privation. Redman never made it to the top, but he did send word back to Europe that he had found a snow-capped mountain located under the equator in eastern Africa. This sounded completely absurd to many European scholars and scientists, and many vehemently denied that such a thing could be true. Despite the controversy of, this, of the claim, some explorers wanted to know more, and soon these men were making the trek to see the Great Mountain for themselves. By 1880, Tanganyika was an official colony of Germany. The demand for porters went up as many Europeans came to the country. As the overall numbers of Europeans increased in Tanganyika, so did the number of scientists, scholars, and explorers that came to visit Mount Kilimanjaro. Because of this, not only did the number of overall porters grow, but there began to be specialized mountain porters. By the time German geographer Hans Meyer came in 1887, there were already many people specialized in hiring out porters. Meyer's expedition led him to become the first recorded man to summit Mount Kilimanjaro. His self-written record of the trip explains what the relationship between a European leader and his porters was like. It is obvious from the beginning of Meyer's narrative that the black African porters were seen as inferior to the white European man, a relationship that was not foreign to the porters. 
as they were always seen as less than the Arab traders. Meyer begins by talking about the different porters as though he were critiquing different breeds of an animal. He says that he liked the Somal because they submitted to his will, but the Bantu were superior in that they withstood the heat better. His favorite porters were those that submitted to his will. In order to impose dominance on his porters, he would beat his porters for any offense. The punishment for those who disobe disobeyed started with at least 10 to 20 lashes across the back. The beatings were done in front of other porters so as to teach them who was in charge. Neither proper clothing nor proper sleeping accommodations were provided for the porters. They walked barefoot up the mountain. As a result, they always had to watch for a hole, a stone, a stump, a thorn, a snake, or a colony of ants. They also frequently suffered blisters due to trying marches across burning steeps. At night, they would be forced to sleep out in the open without protection from the elements or wildlife. Meyer said that after a day's work, porters would fling themselves down among the boulders for the night. The only exception to this is when they were able to take shelter in the occasional mountain cave, a practice that would continue long after the colonial period ended. Porters Often, porters were often given one meal of rice, beans, or maize to sustain them through the day. Meyer said, if your porter can but once a day have his fill of rice, beans, or millet, he is fully equal to a tramp of five or six hours in the blazing sun, carrying in addition to his load of 60 or 65 pounds, his gun and ammunition, a cooking pot, a sleeping mat, a water calabash, and a number of other unconsidered trifles. I was unable to find any record that indicated that the porters actually felt nourished to perform their jobs on one meal a day. The porters were paid half of their salaries before the trek began, and the other half after they completed their journeys. One reason for this may have been because some porters made unceasing attempts to desert the caravan. Caravan leaders were often suspicious of their porters due to their tendency to run away. They saved the second half of the pay for the end as an incentive for porters to complete the expedition. Another account written by British explorer H.H. H. Johnston of his expedition on Mount Kilimanjaro illustrates a similar relationship with the porters to that of Hans Meyer. He also begins his account by talking about the different breeds of porters. Johnston preferred the Zanzibaris. It was important to Johnston that the porters quickly knew who was in charge. On one occasion, the porters stopped to take a break without his permission. Johnston used this offense as an opportunity to exert his power by publicly beating one of the porters. Johnston said, whilst the recalcitrant porter was still screaming abjectly for pardon, and I was still counting the strokes of the wand, eight, nine, 10, 11, the other men had hoisted their loads on their bullet heads and were falling into file along the narrow path, leaving my servant and myself alone with the victim of our wrath. Caravan leaders frequently used violence to send messages of dominance. This violence was even portrayed as beneficial for the European leaders. Johnston continues, the temporary burst of just anger not only brought a flush of color to my pallid face, but seemed to restore strength to my limbs. In his account, Johnston contrasts the porter's poor sleeping conditions with his own relatively luxurious ones. While the porters were sleeping outside in the rain, Johnston's servant brought him a bowl of hot and savory soup before he retired to his nice dry bed. Although both Hans Meyer and H.H. Johnston saw themselves as racially superior to their porters, both would have died without their porter's aid. Both explorers contracted debilitating illnesses and had to be carried in hammocks by the porters. Without the porters, the European explorers would have had to find another way to haul their gear, food, and water. They also would have had to cook their own food and set up their own camp. Because of this, the explorers saw the porters as valuable assets that could be beaten, but not to the extent that they could not work or die. Basic health care was provided to the porters. Myers described a man performing the duties of a doctor so that the porters could continue. Since the late 1800s, the number of people that climbed Mount Kilimanjaro has drastically increased, and the purpose of the expeditions has shifted from colonial explora exploration to outdoor recreation. By the 1950s, there are about 1,000 people climbing Mount Kilimanjaro annually. In 1961, Tanganyika and Zanzibar combined to become the independent country of Tanzania. To celebrate this, Mount Kilimanjaro's highest peak's name was changed from Kaiser Wilhelm Spitz, a name given by Hans Meyer, Hans Meyer to Uhuru Peak, meaning freedom in Swahili. 
The new government used Mount Kilimanjaro as a means to bring tourists to the country in order to boost economic growth. By the mid-1990s, 11,000 people were climbing the mountain annually. In 2007, 40,701 tourists visited Mount Kilimanjaro. The number continues to grow every year. Though the nature of the trips to summit Though the nature of the trips to summit Mount Kilimanjaro has changed, the nature of the porters' working conditions still resembles their working conditions during the colonial period. African history expert Dr. Leslie Hadfield states, as mountain tourism developed on Kilimanjaro, it did so within a colonial context. Rich foreigners are still coming to Mount Kilimanjaro as the porters' bosses. Porters are still carrying heavy packs on their heads. They are still climbing with inadequate clothing. They are still being underpaid, underfed, and underprotected in the 21st century. There are many people around the world that are suffering from poor working conditions, but it is unacceptable that wealthy trekkers climb for a good cause, while the porters that keep the climbers alive on the mountain exist on the edge of poverty. The porters deserve better working conditions, but it is hard to bring about change when the outside world is unaware of the issue. Hardly any literature exists on porters, and almost no literature has been written from the perspective of the porter. Trust me, I spent hours searching. Dr. Coco Malubo, an expert on porters and a Tanzanian, has helped this problem through his published chapter, The Working Condition of Wagumu, High Altitude Porters on Mount Kilimanjaro, in the book Mountaineering Tourism. In this chapter, he expands on the issues previously discussed in this paper. Malubo states that 20 porters die every year on Mount Kilimanjaro due to poor clothing, little food, and lack of medical care. He reveals that porters are still taken advantage of by being underpaid and overburdened despite regulations made by modern organizations and the government to protect the porters. The main organization that Dr. Malubo talks about is the Kilimanjaro Porter Assistance Project, KPOP. KPOP is an organization whose goal is to improve the porters' working conditions by lending mountain clothing to porters free of charge, advocating for fair wages, and ethical treatment by all companies climbing Kilimanjaro, encouraging climbers to an ethical climb, and to educate porters through classes as funding allows. K-pop also partners with companies that adhere to Tanzanian laws regarding porters, as well as to regulations set by K-pop itself. In order for a company to become a partner, they must allow K-pop to monitor the company's salary distribution, tipping procedure, food and transportation provision, bag weight, medical care, etc. K-pop also requires that the porters are given tents. Every year, companies are evaluated and porters are interviewed. K-pop continues to partner with the companies as long as they pass the evaluation each year. This is beneficial because tourists know that a climate company is ethical if it is partners with K-pop. Organizations such as K-pop, are trying to help porters. People that have climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, as well as scholars on modern African issues, are trying to help porters by raising awareness. Every climber can help porters by choosing to climb with ethical climbing companies. A difference can be made and has to be made because as Dr. Malubo perfectly says, the porters are the heart and soul of the trekkers of the mountain. Understanding that the working conditions that porters face today are not new, but rather rooted in history, can help us to understand the real roots of the problem. This will help us to create better solutions. Thanks for listening to my paper. Hope you're all staying healthy and safe.